I'm very pleased and also rather surprised to see so many people come back for a second talk after yesterday, but thank you for coming. Um, I'm particularly pleased to see Dr. Singer um, coming here to see the talk. The only reason I, I ended up giving two talks is because he avoided my first one, so um, I was I, wanting to insist that he see at least, at least one presentation. So yes, um, as Yossi said, uh, yesterday I was talking about um, a historical perspective partly on the study of, of the nucleolus and what I want to do today is to go through some of the issues that are causing us um, problems, um, things that we struggle with and also things that we're excited about in some of the new aspects of, uh, of, of research that I think are shaping the way uh, going forward. So as a preamble to this talk, <coughs> I just wanted to, to, to raise the point, for the, particularly for the students in the audience, that I really think um, that we are now in a new golden age for biology. And um, I, I say that because, you know, as a, you, as a new student coming into the field, you may not properly uh, appreciate this, but 30 years ago when I was a PhD student, I, I spent most of my PhD generating reagents with which to do experiments. And now we have available a, a, an absolutely fantastic array of technology platforms for microscopy, for detecting RNAs, as we saw this morning from, from, from Rob, uh, um, in vivo with high resolution for doing time-lapse microscopy, uh, as we saw from, from Gil also for doing you know, wonderful bioinformatics. Um, and I, I'd like to uh, address the issue of, of omics technology, in particular proteomics. So I wanted to start by posing the question, um, why don't we already know everything? Because um, you know, the genomes are sequenced for human and for most of the model organisms that we work with. Um, as we've seen in uh, presentations here, um, we know the sequences of, of the genes. We can localize them in situ by fluorescence hybridization. Um, we can identify where whole chromosomes reside, where individual genes reside. And for an increasing number of proteins, we also have high-resolution 3D protein structures. We know the rules of the genetic code, the, the DNA makes RNA makes protein. So why, why don't we then know everything already? Uh, and why haven't uh, the genome sequences already fulfilled the potential um, of, of, you know, promised with the Genome Project to revolutionize drug discovery in a, in a brave new world? And I want to say that my own perspective in this is to highlight what I see as a, a really quite a profound difference between genomes and proteomes. So the term genome is really a collective term for lots of genes within an organism. And similarly, proteomes is, is an adjective uh, coined to describe the collection of proteins in, in an organism or organelle or, or particular substructure of a cell. So we are very used to the concept of a reference genome where although we know that there are small differences in the precise genome sequences between each of us in this room, by and large for humans or any other model organism, um, it makes a lot of sense and is very useful to have a database that has a, a reference genome that captures the, the, the full genomic information for that organism that you can look up when you need to. And a lot of people working in the proteomics field have then by extension um, assume then that we, we simply make uh, reference proteomes by collecting lists of all the proteins that the organism can make. And I feel uh, personally that, that this is actually a big mistake. And so I think, which hasn't made me completely popular in the proteomics field, that this concept of a reference proteome is a misguided one because it's not driven by the biological perspective on what the protein sequences can tell us. What instead I think we need to focus on are not the identifications of proteins, but rather their properties. And what do I mean by that? Well, uh, properties, one of the simplest is how much of the protein is actually being expressed in both relative and absolute terms. And unlike the situation with genes, um, protein copy levels vary enormously between individual genes. So two different genes on the same chromosome can give rise to uh, proteins with copy numbers differing by a hundred thousand to a million fold or more. So there's a huge dynamic range in protein expression. Obviously, as we've been discussing extensively during this meeting, uh, proteins are not homogeneously mixed within the cell. Um, instead, they're localized in very discrete places, and uh, we've seen many examples of of how the exquisite localization of proteins determine their function. So we need to know where they are and their locations can vary. Also, many of the proteins, in fact, I suspect in, in higher eukaryotes, most 
uh, don't act in isolation. Rather, they act as part of molecular machines and form uh, supramolecular complexes, um, which can be quite large in, in the case of polymerases and uh, ribosomes and, and many other forms of molecular machines. So we have to know who the interaction partners are for the different proteins. And then uh, <coughs> Gill was mentioning how the repertoire of diversity is expanded by alternative splicing, and I'll come back to that. It's also uh, enormously expanded and regulated by post-translational modifications, both reversible and irreversible modifications. So this is a big thing, which is uh, something that we have to determine largely empirically, because you can't reliably infer uh, when, where, or how much a protein will be modified simply from inspection of its primary sequence. No more than you can tell just by looking at its promoter sequence how many copies of that protein will exist at any one time. But the other fundamental difference, I think, here is that all these properties are dynamic in a way that simply isn't the case for genomes. So genomes change, but they change in evolutionary time, whereas proteins change in more or less real time in response to the many signals that affect the cell. So proteomics, then, has really uh, undergone a, a quite a profound change, and especially as I'll talk about uh, the current technologies for mass spectrometry-based protein identification, they've moved from simply being an improved version of Edmund sequencing, allowing us ever-increasing sensitivity, to providing an exciting and um, varied platform for performing quantitative assays on a wide range of critical protein properties, which in turn uh, determine biological responses and regulatory mechanisms. And so we are really now faced with a problem of multidimensional analytics where we can take advantage of this power of the technology to measure things. And I think that the real maximum impact looking forward for proteomics and cell biology, and why I think it's so exciting, is that we can not only use it to test existing hypotheses, but um, as I'll attempt to illustrate, we can use it in an unbiased way to generate new hypotheses which wouldn't be automatically forthcoming, which can drive forward, hopefully, discovery and insights into biological mechanisms. So just to summarize that part, what I'm saying is that um, how cells function and respond to signals, stress, growth, cell cycle, etc., is largely determined by a dynamic and constantly changing set of properties for more than 10,000 different types of proteins expressed over a wide dynamic range. And our challenge then is to come up with methodologies that allow us to quantitatively measure and analyze these properties systematically in an unbiased way. And some of the, the challenges and perspectives I'd like to address is how to link them not only to genes, but also to help us to uncover where a gene is giving rise to different isoforms, uh, and Gil touched on this uh, earlier, um, but also not only structural isoforms, but also distinct pools of the same polypeptide chain, which perhaps they're interacting with different partners, is performing different functions in different places and at different times. And how we can compare these properties between different cell types, the differentiation states, and genetic backgrounds. And the good news, I think, um, is that it is possible to do this. And I think the main driving technology for this are various uh, uh, iterations of uh, quantitative proteomics based on the use of mass spectrometry. Um, and as I say, I think this has changed so much that we can really talk about now uh, next generation proteomics, where both the methodologies, the instrumentation, and the downstream data analysis combine to provide a very powerful platform technology. Now certainly when I was a student, and even till quite recently, I think, for many of the, the older members of the room, I'm not just looking here to, to my left, um, but uh, for, ex for example, um, maybe didn't train in mass spectrometry uh, when, when they were graduate students. And so what I wished I'd had when I was a, a graduate student, or indeed um, a young PI, um, was a cell biologist guide to proteomics. And so since one didn't exist, we created one. Um, this is linked to my lab website. And if you're interested, uh, please have a look. We've tried to collect here a lot of both technical information, but also um, basic descriptions, um, answering the sort of questions you'd like to know the answer to, but perhaps um, like Rob here are too embarrassed to ask, like what actually is a spectrum? Um, and uh, uh, you know, what does it mean? And, and what do these signals uh, actually refer to? So I'm just going to spend a, a couple of slides then, um, in case some of you are, are less familiar with this, just working through the workflow, because a lot of people also in, in the biological community who engage with this technology now tend to do it by 
getting samples and then sending them off to a facility um, and, and getting the data back. And that's fine. And that's the way that uh, you know, a lot of it will work. But I think it can still be useful uh, to understand how the process is actually going. Um, obviously, you start off with your, your cells and the design of the experiment. I won't go into it at this point. Um, assuming then you've extracted the, the, the proteins, our typical workflow involves um, downstream of the protein isolation, extensive chromatography, either by uh, acrylamide gels or increasingly by uh, denaturing size exclusion chromatography to separate the proteins. Um, this helps both increase the coverage of the, of the peptide detection um, and also gives us information, and I'll illustrate later how we can use that information to uncover uh, details about structural isoforms. And then there's quite a, a detailed set of processing steps, but I just want to highlight the fact that we normally perform this analysis bottom-up, where the proteins are digested by, specific, by cleavage with specific enzymes, usually trypsin, but it could be other enzymes, into, pe into um, peptide fragments. And it's the peptide fragments which are ionized and analyzed uh, later in the mass spectrometer. And then there's the, the, the huge challenge of actually making sense of the data that come out the other end. So one of the, the key things is that the instrumentation has developed uh, really at breakneck speed in the, in, in, in the last decade or so. Um, and I just will highlight this now, I'll, I'll say straight away, although I'm illustrating this with equipment made by one manufacturer, which is what we use, um, sadly I'm not paid by this manufacturer, I'm just a customer. Um, but nonetheless, this is the first um, of, the, uh, of, of the really powerful Orbitrap uh, family of mass spectrometers using the technology that Alexander Makarov developed called the, the Orbitrap, which has now been shrunk down to benchtop size. Admittedly, Quite a sturdy big bench top, but nonetheless, uh, this actually is in, in, in a room in, in my lab rather than the central facility. And um, despite its reduced size, it is an incredibly powerful technology. And I thought that um, some of you might be interested to see just a little bit about how it works before we go on to discuss how we can use the information. So I've shamelessly uh, borrowed or stolen a um, uh, uh, rather uh, beautiful. Um, movie that, that the, the company Thermo have made and it's on the web. Some of you may have seen it already, but I know that, that some of you haven't. And so I thought I would show this because it just illustrates what you're actually doing when you're ionizing peptides and how the machine is, is detecting them. So I'll run the movie. So this, this is just a, an overview then. So this is the source where we separate the peptides to be analyzed and spray them into the machine. Like a microscope, it has a lens to focus the peptides. This bend is a very useful uh, feature in the device because it means that the charged ions turn the corner and go into the, uh, into the analyzer, whereas uncharged species you don't want smack against the wall and are filtered out. So here's just a, a view, a peptide eye view. So here are the peptides being sprayed in to the mass spectrometer and each colored ball we can think of as a separate peptide. They move into the, the S lens here, which concentrates and focuses the beam. Um, then they go through here and they go through, a, a, here they turn the corner if they are charged species. And then you go through the, the, the quadrupole mass filter. Here we're not filtering, we're doing an MS1 scan. And so all the ions are then collected, concentrated and cooled in this C-trap and then shot into the Orbitrap mass analyzer here, which you'll see in a second. Um, now, I don't have time to go into exactly how this works, but the, the basic principle is you have charged ions which rotate uh, here um, in this uh, analyzer chamber, and um, the frequency of, of their rotation sets up a, a, an electric current based on, on a moving charge. And uh, by doing complex uh, analysis, uh, that uh, frequency is a function of the mass to charge ratio, and you can derive that information and correct the spectrum, collect the, the spectrum. So here's an example where we can do MS2 analysis, where you can inject a mixture of peptides, of, of charged ions, and then in the filter here, we start to select out all the masses we don't want. So you'll see them being shot off here. And you're left with just one species of, of peptide. That's then carried straight on into a collision cell because to complete the identification here, what we do is we take that uh, unique species of ion and collide it against uh, gas molecules to fragment it. And the fragmentation pattern allows you then to take the fragmented species, inject that into the mass analyzer, which you'll see in a second. There it goes. 
Um, and then once again, you can collect a spectrum of the fragments derived from collision-induced fragmentation um, of that peptide, which allow you to infer the sequence of the peptide. And the machinery is um, powerful enough that it, it can uh, do this to speed things up. Um, while it's analyzing the mass of, of one fragmented peptide sample, it's already collecting and colliding the next one. So this uh, increases the speed with which this all works. Um, and so you achieve speeds of, of more than one spectrum per second. So um, this is very powerful, very elegant technology. Um, and I, I hope that's of uh, interest then to, to some of you, if you hadn't been familiar with that, to get a, a brief overview of how the, the technology works. So having said that, um, I'll just come back and say that the first paper I published together with my um, uh, friend and longtime uh, collaborator, Matthias Mann, um, when we were both group leaders at the EMBL in Heidelberg, and Matthias and I had labs next door to each other, this was the first time I used this sort of technology. It certainly wasn't an Orbitrap, it hadn't been invented. It was a much larger machine, um, and uh, we used it in, 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 in a paper where we identified, and we're very proud of the fact we'd identified one protein. Um, these days, we are routinely identifying more than one protein. Um, we, we are uh, identifying thousands and thousands of proteins and tens of thousands of peptides in multiple different control and experimental cases at many different time points. And so what that really means is that in the last few years, the analysis of proteomics has moved into the realm of what you call big data. And uh, you see, Rob, I put that in big letters to make the, the point. Um, so this is, thanks, good. So um, that's really one of the challenges, is to deal with the mountain of data that come out. And um, just to put this into some sort of perspective, um, you may be familiar with this. This isn't the Orbitrap, uh, although you might see some similarity. This is an image of part of the, the, the beamline for the Large Hadron Collider, which you may have heard recently announced the probable uh, final identification, or the probable identification of the, of the Higgs boson. We estimate that, um, or they estimate, not we, um, that, that they're generating from the Hadron Collider something in the order of 15 petabytes of data per year. Now, by comparison, um, this uh, Q-Exactive Orbitrap on my benchtop is, we are estimating, generating currently about 15 terabytes, which is already quite a lot of, of, of data. However, that misses the point, I think, because it may, it may or may not come as a surprise to learn that while I have one of these sitting on my benchtop, and hopefully soon uh, more, um, most particle physicists don't have a large hadron collider sitting on their benchtop. And so when we look at the 15 petabytes uh, per year, we're talking about the, the, the sum of data being generated by an entire field. Whereas what we're really talking about in the proteomics field is 15 terabytes times every instrument in my lab, your lab, and all the facilities. And so I think that, in fact, already in the proteomics field, we are much closer to matching the volume of data that our colleagues in the particle physics field are producing. And since I don't think there'll be many more uh, large hadron colliders generated anytime soon, the number of these instruments being used for biological research is increasing rapidly. And so I'm pretty confident in predicting that we will not only match, but overtake the volume of data being produced in the particle physics community, which is quite a challenge. And, and just to put that into perspective, with current technology for storage devices, um, he, here's just some names. Now, a, a few years ago, I had barely heard of terabyte. I guess we all know about this, and we all know what petabytes. Uh, I wonder how many people honestly knew what an exabyte was. Uh, and put your hand up if you know what a zettabyte was. <laughs> Shows a, a few hands maybe going out. If you know what this was, very sad, uh, I think. Um, <laughs> I don't even want to to go there. But, you know, our vocabulary has been continually uh, expanded by having to learn the names for a thousandfold larger storage devices uh, for the volumes of data being produced. So, as I said, we're already at the point of working in the terabyte to petabyte range with, with, with current day proteomics data and rapidly heading towards the, the, the challenge of, 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 of working in the exabyte range as, as a community. Now, with current storage uh, devices, you know, to store an exabyte of data would take something the size of, of this advanced study center um, full of storage devices. Now, obviously, one hopes that further miniaturization and improvements will, will change that, but it's just to put in, in practice. By the time we get down to here, you need something about the size of Manhattan to study it, and um, I, I have no idea whether we could 
store that or not. I hope we don't get there. But um, this is something we have to take on board and, and, and think about uh, because these, are, these actually provide real challenges, I, I think, to the community in the genomic era. However, as I'm sure any of the, the bioinformaticists in the audience would, would agree, um, simply collecting and storing data is not data management. And so a really critical feature is not simply generating the data and putting it in some form of cold storage. A big challenge is to properly manage the data in such a way to make it readily accessible for detailed and facile visualization and complex and powerful analysis. And so in the proteomics arena, um, we didn't find uh, tools that allowed us to do this um, in the way we wanted. So for the last uh, four, four to five years, we've been working on a project called Pep Tracker. There's a website here if you want to have a look. And this is a large scale software um, uh, and data science project going on uh, in my lab um, to try to provide an integrated environment with very user friendly tools um, that will manage the data coming out of these quantitative mass spectrometry experiments and make it easy for you as a community to interact with the data um, and to visualize it and, and, and study it. And one of the, the things that that includes is a powerful limb system, uh, a laboratory information management system, which tags every experiment we ever do with a complex, consistent and detailed set of metadata describing all the parameters that we can think of in the experiment. Um, and then one of the values of doing that, and I should say that um, we are happy to distribute this software and make it uh, available to the, to the community. And one of the things that uh, facilitates us doing is using the data in a powerful multi-dimensional uh, data model um, that we've developed in collaboration with our colleagues in the computing science department. Um, and here in particular, we are relating parameters that we measure through the instrumentation, such as ion intensities, ratios of isotopes from SILAC experiments and so forth, um, with a whole set of um, associated metadata on genotype, cell type, who did the experiment, which instrument, what was the date, um, really uh, what was the buffer, was it a nuclear extract, a cytoplasmic extract, and we collect all these things in this th type of uh, model, it's called a sun model because it looks like a, a, a sun with the rays coming off. And we can <coughs> add in as many spokes to this model, uh, including um, information on <coughs> imaging analysis, on RNA and, and genomic uh, data. And our goal in doing this is to, is to tackle the problem that the, there's no such thing, I believe, as a reference proteome where we can take a single set of measurements and put them in a static flat uh, file, but rather to capture the dynamic aspect um, we're trying to build what I call an encyclopedia of proteome dynamics that relies upon the construction <coughs> of a reasonably sophisticated data warehouse approach where we can automate the steps in this process to make them as efficiently as possible and through doing that cope with the, the, the storage of the data in a highly managed way that will make the data as available as possible um, for detailed uh, multi-dimensional analysis. Now the corollary of that is it opens up the opportunity to slightly modify the way we think about doing the experiments. Not to give up on the, the, the classical model, which we all do, is that individual members of the lab think of an idea, carry out an experiment, um, generate the data, and uh, at, at the end try to draw some conclusions, get some results and predictions, and, um, and then, uh, you know, if, if Tom's managing your, your paper for JCB, then some point way down here you might get to publish it. Um, so that's the standard model and that's of course what we all do. But as we generate experiments producing larger and larger amounts of information and with me being Scottish and, and genetically um, unwilling to consider throwing things away, um, I'm the sort of person who has an attic full of stuff that I never use, um, we realize that while an individual student or postdoc tends to focus on a tiny fraction of the data they generate in these large experiments that are germane to the question they're asking. A lot of the other information that's generated is also very useful uh, and collectively useful. For example, if you're doing a protein pull-down experiment, it's actually very helpful to know and remember all the proteins that you rigor rigorously showed were not interaction partners which is very different from simply not detecting proteins. To have detected a protein and established it is not an interaction partner, typically the, the student or postdoc won't care about it um, because they want to focus on the ones they think are, but knowing under which genotypes or uh, uh, experimental conditions a protein doesn't interact, collectively that information is rather useful. And so um, by taking on that on board, 
Um, we're moving to a situation in, in the last three or four years where we're trying to conduct what I call super experiments, not just because they're good experiments, I hope, but super in the sense of, of the scale. And all I'm meaning by that is by taking the care to collect information from all the experiments we do in, in, in proteomics, annotate them consistently and, and in detail, and, and gather them then into a complex multidimensional database as well as deriving the results and, and, and answers to any individual question we asked, the collected data together allows us by uh, analysis in multi-dimensions of all these parameters to also derive <coughs> results and create new hypotheses based on the cumulative analysis of all the data, um, which can include results to questions that nobody asked when they designed an individual experiment. So that's what I mean by thinking that we can um, use these tools not only to test hypotheses we already have, but also to generate new hypotheses that we hadn't thought of, such as um, in an automated fashion, discovering that a particular post-translational modification correlates with the location of a protein in a particular subcellular compartment under certain genotypes but not others, for example, or under stress conditions but not other types. And then we can go and follow that up with downstream experiments. So I'm going to move on then to um, tell you about some of the ways we're applying this technology uh, to address specific questions and also to raise another couple of things that I, I think in, in the future um, are, are, are quite important. So as I said, our aim is to measure these dynamic properties for as many of the proteins we can in a cell um, and that includes um, not just identifying proteins within cells but addressing in more detail which subcellular compartments the proteins localize to and also to quantitate that to be able to estimate what fraction of each protein at any one time is in each compartment. We also want to see how the expression and, and, and localization of the proteins changes over time, for example, as cells progress through the cell cycle, and I'll say a bit about that. And of course, we want to perturb the cells in a number of different ways, including through the addition of small molecule inhibitors, and watch uh, in, in time the kinetics of how the proteome redistribu redistributes and how the properties of the proteins change um, over time in response to perturbations of this sort. So I'm going to first of all address the issue of subcellular localization. And to do that, I just want to highlight the, f the, the, the point that a side effect of most proteomic analysis that's done when you take cells and extract the proteins is that we move from a situation like this to one like that. In other words, all this exquisite information about subcell subcellular compartmentalization is lost within the extract. So there's a lot of information there lost and the, the measurements that we make in our proteome experiments are population averages across cell populations. To some extent that's unavoidable but we can of course uh, take um, care to, to address this um, by cell fractionation. So instead of making extracts from intact cells, um, we've gone down the route of fractionating cells using defined protocols that are reproducible and we've started off by just concentrating in particular and comparing the cytoplasm uh, with the nucleus. And of course we're highlighting the nucleolus because that's the most important part of the, the cell as I told you yesterday. Um, uh, increasingly however we've expanded this sort of fractionation protocol um, so that we now look in more detail at multiple uh, cytoplasmic fractions to separate different membrane and, and cytosolic fractions and so forth and therefore derive more information. Um, I want to just quickly summarize then um, how uh, one does this and compare it with, with conventional approaches in cell biology. The conventional approach would be microscopy. So here are these three compartments using marker proteins that, that label the cytoplasm, uh, nuclei or, or nucleoli as you see there. And if you use the, uh, an antibody to confirm this, and I hope uh, some of the members of the audience who may thought yesterday I was disrespectful to the lamins will see that in fact the lamins were, were, were used uh, here. Um, and they are at least useful as controls. So uh, I just want to make that point that I'm not anti-lamin. Um, so without laboring the point, it's fairly clear. The first lane in each case in a Western blot um, is just the total cell lysate. So that's the mixture of everything. And as you can see, separating out the fractions using an antibody for uh, here for uh, a cytoplasmic marker, a tubulin, you see it's predominantly in the cytoplasm. And the Western blotting data confirm the microscopy data, and that's fine. The way we do the, um, the proteomics experiments is that we label all the proteins in each of the subcellular fractions with different stable isotopes of, of uh, carbon or nitrogen or hydrogen. And in doing that, 
there's a signature which we can resolve in the mass spectrometer for every peptide which tells us whether it was localized in the cytoplasm, the nucleus, or, or, or the nucleolus. And I'm, I'm happy to describe in more detail exactly how the experiment's done afterwards, but just to give you an illustration, this uh, below illustrates here um, the signals from a peptide from tubulin. It's detected by the antibody here. And in this case, we encoded the cytoplasm with the, with the light isotopes so that all the intensity signal is in, in the, the light peak, whereas here the, the nucleoplasmic signal or the nuclear signal was encoded with the medium isotope, so you see virtually no signal now um, for the light form of this peptide and little or no signal for the heavier form. And for the nucleolus, just like you see by microscopy and by Western blotting, you see almost all the signal in the heaviest isotopic peak. And for each peptide, there are three different peaks, and these ratios then are telling you how much of that protein was in each compartment. So at this point, um, one of my colleagues was rude enough to say to me, okay, you've just spent the best part of a million dollars on, on microscopy equipment and so forth, and uh, now you're telling me that tubulin cytoplasmic and the lamin's in the nucleus uh, and uh, rna Paul one is in the nucleolus, what, you know, what, what's the beef? And um, uh, I'd like to say he was no longer a member of my department, but it's not true. Um, so the point here is that this technology not only can recapitulate the information you get here, but it does it in a much higher throughput quantitative way um, because we don't just measure in one experiment a single peptide for each of these proteins. We might typically measure anything from 5 to 25 peptides or even more per protein. And then we can average the results from every peptide. So we're making multiple measurements and we're collecting data in a single experiment from you know, 5, 10 or even more thousand proteins at once. Um, from as many as uh, 20 or 50,000 peptides. So it's the equivalent of doing these Western blots um, with, uh, you know, five or 10,000 antibodies in, or, or more in, in, in one experiment. And, and that's where I think um, you, we can get a lot of value from this type of analysis. So we've used this ability to isotopically encode subcellular fractions, to use that to determine localization, and then added in um, experiments using pulse labeling to look at parameters such as protein synthesis degradation and turnover rates and actually look in individual compartments to see how this worked. And again, we've come up with strategies, as I said at the beginning, where we combine the flexible nature of differential isotope labeling and mass spectrometry um, to uh, develop assays to reveal different uh, aspects of protein properties. We came up with the protocol where for every time point we have a 50% mix of unlabeled light cells together with a 50% mix of cells where all the proteins have um, had their carbon and nitrogen replaced. Uh, uh, well, in this case, actually, just the carbon replaced with C12 with C13. That's a so-called medium uh, labeled state. Um, and at the, at the beginning of the experiment, it's a 50-50 mix of, of these two. We then pulse into the medium cells, the heavier amino acids, where we have C13 and N15 um, for arginine and lysine, and we look then at the ratio of incorporation of these isotopes so that 50% of the cells are changing because of the, f the pulse, and as a control, 50% are always the same. And that ability to always make the correlation back to knowing that this sample is always 50% of the signal turned out to be very helpful for ensuring the accuracy um, of the data analysis. And then from that mixture of cells, because the mass spectrometer can sort out the ratios of the isotopes without having to keep the protein separate, we are able to mix the cells together and perform cell fractionation on the mixture of cells at each time point, therefore eliminating a lot of experimental variables to do with differential recovery of the proteins and so forth, again improving the accuracy of the experiment, and then trying to relate these parameters to, to subcellular localization. By doing the experiment in this way, um, we can measure the change in the ratio of, of several different things. For example, the rate of protein degradation is related to the rate of disappearance of the medium signal, which is 50% at time zero, uh, relative to the constant light signal, because the removal of that is principally caused by protein degradation for most of the proteins. Whereas the increase in the heavy signal in the pulse sample against the light over time is conversely related to the rate of protein uh, translation. Um, and then there are several ways uh, we can measure the turnover rate, uh, both the replacement rate and also by measuring the curves for degradation and synthesis, looking at the point where these curves intersect. So that's a way we can generate lots of data. Um, 
Putting these into Excel spreadsheets is a very difficult and boring way to present the data. So we've built um, something called turnover viewers, where we again use the computational approach to capture this information, make it available to the community, so that you can look at not only the experimental design, but you have tools available that color code uh, uh, cartoons of the cell, showing how much of each protein is present uh, from this analysis in each subcellular fraction. Um, and uh, we have data sets that include uh, data on over 8,000 proteins, including their subcellular localization, their abundance measurements, um, and their synthesis degradation and turnover rates. Importantly, we collect and present this information also at the peptide level. Because it, this is a bottom-up approach, I'm aware of the fact that in order to generate the data, we've digested all the proteins into peptides, and then we attempt to recombine the peptides in the way we think makes sense as to which protein they came from. But you have to be aware of the fact that that's not an exact science at the moment. We might make mistakes, so one has the ability to interrogate these data sets for any individual peptide that we've detected and, and see for yourself the primary data. And this is just how we can compare um, for any peptide the, the curves showing the degradation and synthesis rates. Um, and the way we've set the experiments up, um, we also have error bars in, in all these data. So I just want to mention very quickly, um, there's a paper I can refer you to that was published a, a couple of months ago, um, or indeed you can look at the turnover viewer if you want more details. I just want to draw one general conclusion from that, and that's that we observe that while most proteins show similar turnover rates in the nucleus and the cytoplasm, the most general feature we saw is that the major exceptions include um, components of large macromolecular complexes, including <coughs> ribosome subunits, SNARPs, uh, and polymerases, where you see that the assembly of these complexes occurs in a different subcellular compartment to where they function. For example, it's often stated uh, in the literature and widely believed that ribosomal proteins are very stable, and that's absolutely true if you look at the, the cytoplasmic pool of ribosomal proteins that have successfully assembled into ribosome subunits. These proteins are extremely stable and long-lived. If you look at the ribosomal proteins that are newly translated and have entered the nucleus to assemble into nascent ribosome subunits, you find actually they're rather unstable. And the same holds true for um, subunits of other large complexes. There are a few corollaries for, from this that I'd be happy to discuss and implications from that about how cells coordinate the assembly of macromolecular complexes, but at least in higher eukaryotic cells, I strongly suspect that, that the assembly of most of these complexes is not driven by a terribly careful balanced stoichiometry of production of the components, but rather um, by the, the rapid degradation of any excess of an individual subunit that's not needed at any one moment in time. Another corollary of this is that if you overexpress proteins in your experiments, which is GFP tag proteins, uh, and you want to measure their half-lives, simply don't expect the half-life of a tagged overexpressed protein to relate closely to the half-life of its endogenous counterpart. Well, you might think that sounds obvious, inspection of the literature suggests it isn't, it isn't always considered. So that was one general conclusion from this study, amongst many things. Um, this is just an example uh, averaged across the whole cell, and I think we're going to hear more tomorrow about the proteins at this end of the curve, which are very uh, long-lived and stable and, and very interesting. We have focused on the proteins down here. So while the, the vast majority of cellular proteins um, turn over uh, in a rather uh, boring way, um, and, and not particularly um, regulated either to stabilize them or, or anything else, there's a small subset down here, 5% or less of the proteins, probably less, which are very rapidly turned over with respect to all the rest. And we're in a position to, to assess that. And this is highly enriched with proteins that are already known to be regulated in many ways. It includes lots of cell cycle regulated proteins where we already know that targeted degradation of proteins at specific stages of the cell cycle is a mechanism involved in regulations. So it's not just RNA stability, but also protein stability that's important. So we've carried out a project then that specifically targets um, proteins that are rapidly turned over. And uh, in order to identify, as we are interested in biological mechanisms, novel examples of proteins which are being regulated at the level of protein stability. Um, and yesterday I mentioned one example of a protein that was contributing to regulating protein stability, the FMN2 protein. So we carried out 
um, uh, an unbiased screen, again, based on the SILAC technology that, that Matthias Mann uh, in introduced, um, where we use three isotopic uh, states, again, of labeling the proteins, and we compare a control with um, cells grown in the presence of inhibitors that either block protein synthesis or protein degradation. And once again, we combine our analysis with a divide and conquer approach, where we compare the analysis of the entire uh, uh, proteins extracted from, from the cell with proteins extracted from fractionated um, subcompartments <coughs> of the cell, and we combine that also with size exclusion chromatography to separate the proteins by size before putting them into the, the mass spectrometer. Um, and just to, uh, hello, this uh, computer seems to be rather slowly. So uh, the, the, the size fractionation by SEC is very effective, and we see uh, the different fractions coming off the column um, by and large, uh, correlate very closely with the, with the sizes of proteins as estimated from the genomic sequence. Um, and we can also estimate, um, by looking at, at, at the different fractions we've obtained, how much we've enriched for marker proteins that one expects to find in these compartments. And then, once again, um, that, that tells us that the data are pretty good. We've performed this analysis with three biological replicates, which is very important because it allows us to measure p-values to assess the quality of the data, and then to perform these type of volcano plots, uh, plots with the analysis, where what we're looking at here, in this case just focusing on protein where uh, inhibiting protein synthesis with cyclohexamide can highlight proteins that are, are being rapidly degraded in the absence of, of new synthesis. So we're looking at proteins over in this region of the plot here, where the, the p-values show high, high significance, uh, and where... Um, uh, also, the, the, the levels of the protein are changing significantly. Um, I'll just mention then, because of the spatial dimension to this analysis, we have these data not only for whole cell extracts, but also for membrane fractions, cytosolic fractions, nuclear fractions, cytoskeletal fractions. Um, and the ongoing analysis of this project um, has revealed quite a lot of uh, interesting and exciting information, um, as well as highlighting some individual proteins that we are pursuing the detailed molecular characterization of, including some extremely interesting proteins that hadn't been studied before. I'll just mention one example um, of one of the proteins we're, we're pursuing. Um, this is a protein that is called MRFAP1. Uh, we call it Mr. Fap, and I'll justify that in a second. Um, this is a protein we actually found in several different screens. It turned up both as one of the most rapidly degraded proteins in the cell. It also turned up in a separate um, screen we carried out to look at proteins downstream of the nedylation pathway. Um, nedylation is one of the sumo-like, uh, ubiquitin-like post-translational modifications. Um, a drug that's currently in clinical trial from the company Millennium called MLN4924 is a potent inhibitor of this nedylation pathway down here. Um, and it turns out that, that we could show that this protein, uh, Mr. Fap, uh, normally is, is synthesized but degraded very rapidly and therefore its levels are kept very low. Um, and in the paper we just published, um, we have derived um, a model, which I'm just going to summarize all the experiments here very quickly, but what we believe is happening is that when this protein is stabilized, it's able to um, alter uh, the chromatin state, the modification state of chromatin, by competing um, with this histone deacetylase complex for binding to the, to the chromatin um, uh, binding <coughs> protein MORF4L1. So in other words, when MRFAP1 is, is builds up, it displaces this, this complex um, and prevents recruitment of this new A4 histone deacetylase complex to chromatin. And that not only happens in tissue culture cells, but uh, uh, a clinical PhD student working on, on the project has also shown that this looks to be happening in vivo um, during differentiation of testes cells in, in human. So the fact that it's testes specific um, is my justification for calling it Mr. Fab rather than Mrs. Fab. Um, but it looked like here we were able to, 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 uh, to pull out, using this sort of unbiased screening, one example of proteins regulated at, at the level of stability, which um, both in a tissue culture system and in a physiological system um, uh, are regulated. So I'm going to quickly turn to another of the issues that I think complicate taking full advantage of proteomic analysis for cell biology. Now, this was essentially beautifully introduced by, uh, by Gil th th this morning, um, highlighting how in, in mammalian cells, alternative splicing, for example, is a major contributor to the diversity of functional proteins that, that we see. And this is just a, a simple reminder of the fact 
that when we identify peptides and relate them back to open reading frames in the genome, we have to be aware that many of these open reading frames can be spliced in several different pathways, sometimes in many different pathways, giving rise to different isoforms, and any peptides mapping to exons that are in common between the different isoforms, well, how do we know when we're interpreting the peptide data which isoform they belong to? That's, that's a challenge. But it isn't only alternative splicing. Um, other proteins are, are, are synthesized um, and then subsequently processed by cleavage events to give rise to, to more than one structural isoform. And of course, post-translational modifications alter the structure of proteins, alter their functional properties. And once again, you can have different functional pools, different isoforms of the proteins created, where it can be very hard to know whether the peptides you've identified belong to one functional pool or to multiple functional pools doing quite different things. Um, and just to make the point, it isn't only structurally distinct versions of the proteins that can do different things. The same protein, and I've done quite a number of studies on protein phosphatase 1, which can probably form at least 100 separate complexes, the identical polypeptide with different interaction partners that target it to different substrates in the cell. So when we're trying to pull the information we've measured from peptide analysis and relate that to biological significance, we have to be aware of this issue, which is almost uniformly ignored in proteomic studies, as to whether what we've measured is belonging to proteins, polypeptide chains, that behave as single or more complex separate pools of function in the cell. And this isn't just a theoretical point. Let me illustrate this with a practical example from our own work. Um, we derived some information from the spatial proteomics on uh, a, a protein um, here, NUD-CD, and um, the information suggested that it was present throughout the cell. Now, in a simplistic interpretation of these data, we would have said that, you know, this gene is giving rise to a protein that's found equally in the nucleus of the cytoplasm. Um, a bit more analysis, however, we were, we were able to show that there are at least two, there's actually at least three isoforms, I'll just highlight two of them, um, of this protein, it's actually expressed as two distinct isoforms here, one of which is almost exclusively nuclear, and the other of which is almost exclusively cytoplasmic. So if you don't take this into account, you come to completely the wrong conclusion about what your, your protein's doing. And we've, um, uh, a couple of months ago, uh, published um, a number of papers in, in this issue which highlight these issues and how we are approaching this and how we can use bioinformatic analysis. Coming back to the point that we combine um, uh, extensive protein fractionation either by uh, page gel separation or by size exclusion chromatography before doing the peptide analysis, what we do is we retain information about the detection of the peptides in every fraction that we determine. And we can use that information to relate back to detecting structurally distinct isoforms that can be separated by chromatography. For example, this is just a profiling the ion intensities for the peptides belonging to um, uh, a particular gene product. And what we see is instead of a single peak on the chromatographic separation, in, in fact, we see two peaks. And that's because there are at least two separable forms of this protein, call it A and A prime. But what we are really interested in is correlating that information with properties, functional properties of proteins that we can measure in the experiments that we design. So for example, um, we want to combine the detection of isoforms also with our spatial proteomics information because we've separately recorded information from um, not just from whole cells, but also from cytoplasmic and nuclear fraction. And here, when we look in our cytoplasmic fractions, we find that only one of these isoforms is detected. Whereas when we look um, in the nucleus, we see both of them. So here, uh, we are able to extract much more information from the analysis because what we can see is that there are at least two uh, forms, two isoforms of this protein that we can detect. And we can show that these isoforms are differentially localized within the cell. And we can also superimpose the information from the turnover analysis. So what we can further deduce is that there are two isoforms which differ in their localization and differ in their stability. So that we can see that um, uh, the, uh, here the, the nuclear isoform A uh, has a much shorter half-life than the isoform A prime, which is, formed in, which is found in both the cytoplasm uh, and the nucleus. And once again, I'm highlighting here a single protein, 
But the power of the approach is that in parallel in one experiment, we are doing the same analysis on thousands of proteins in parallel. So that also opens up the opportunity to do um, uh, detailed uh, computer-based estimations. In most proteomics experiments that were done, you simply take the values that you measure for any peptide that's assigned to the open reading frame in the genome, and then you add together all the values you measure for the isotope ratios for all these peptides and divide by the number of peptides. But um, by looking a bit more carefully, and here we're just dividing the cell into, into thirds and adding up the values for each third separately as we go along. And what we can see here already, this is one example where um, in the first two thirds of the protein, all the peptides have rather a different value from the last third. And it turned out that's because this was actually made as a polyprotein, um, which has two different functions and is cleaved separately. So we can combine that with a more high throughput analysis to systematically look for proteins in our data sets where one separate region of the protein has peptides whose values significantly differ from the rest of the protein. And then we can uh, confirm these analysis using more conventional things like cyclohexamide chases and S35 labeling to confirm that we are actually identifying isoforms with differential stability. So I want to quickly finish off by just mentioning very briefly that the, the other way that we lose a lot of information in, in these experiments by averaging is by taking populations of cells which are actually existing at different stages of the cell cycle, mixing them all together in our analysis, uh, and deriving a population average uh, across all stages of the cell cycle. When we know from anecdotal cases that individual proteins can vary in their properties and levels at different stages of the cell cycle. I just want to mention on point that um, well, this is typically done, in many cases, by using well-characterized inhibitors to block the cell cycle progression, therefore accumulate cells at specific stages and analyze them, and we are also doing that. We are also aware of the fact that these inhibitors may have other effects on the metabolism of the cell, and therefore give rise to effects that are separate to cell cycle-specific effects, but rather indirect effects of the inhibitor. So we've also taken the approach of using an alternative methodology based on the the, the simple physical property that as cells progress through the cell cycle, they become larger, they double their DNA and protein content. And you can use an old-fashioned method, but still quite a powerful one, called a counterflow centrifugal elutriation. Um, to, this is the design, so it's based on, on a rotor where you uh, spin the cells with a counterflow of liquid. Um, and in doing that, you can separate cells, as long as they don't clump together, um, according to their stage of the cell cycle, simply because at different stages of the cell cycle, their size is different. And you can validate that this has worked by, collection, by collecting fractions, putting them through the, the, the facts, and seeing that we get this nice separation of cells enriched at different stages of interphase without using any drugs whatsoever. And we can validate um, with known cell cycle markers that the proteome um, uh, uh, markers for different cell cycle stages are as we expect. And then what we've done is to analyze by proteomics um, the protein levels at each of these cell cycle stages. Um, and in, in collaboration with Mike Stratton and Adam uh, uh, Sheen at the, at the Sanger Center, we've also performed RNA sequencing analysis to ask the simple question, uh, is the level of proteins always determined by the level of their RNAs? And in the interest of time, I'm going to skip through to, to the end here and just give you the bottom line. Suffice it to say that we've been able to analyze thousands of proteins already, um, find a relatively small number that, that change. Um, when we look at, uh, at, at uh, the Go annotation terms and do this sort of tag cloud analysis, we see they're highly enriched for, for things like cell cycle progression functions. We see the same thing when we look at transcripts. We've analyzed about 25,000 poly plus uh, RNAs at uh, different stages of the cell cycle. And the bottom line here, however, it's literally at the bottom line, is that when we look at replicate data for RNA or protein analysis, the replicates um, are very highly correlated, very high quality data, correlation coefficients 0 0.98, 0 0.99. But at any individual stage, if we compare RNA and protein levels, at best we see a correlation of about 0 0.5 to 0 0.54. So in other words, what's that saying is the glass is half full or half empty, um, about 50%, we think, of the changes in protein levels that are cell cycle dependent are probably occurring principally by post-transcriptional mechanisms. Now, this is very much an analysis in progress. 
Um, there's still a lot more to be done, but that just highlights the fact that as we routinely use the powerful microarray and RNA sequencing technologies as a surrogate for direct protein detection, that's fine, but please be aware that in many cases, the level of the mRNA may not accurately, accurately reflect at any one time the level of its cognate protein product, let alone the isoforms that can be encoded, um, thanks to the, the, the regulation of protein stability. And once again, we are using this approach of collecting the data together and easy to access um, <coughs> online viewers to make all the data that we generate widely available to the community. So I'm going to stop there. Um, I'd like to once again thank the people who funded this work, principally the Wellcome Trust and, and the European Union. I've tried to mention the people we're working with as we go along. Mark and Andy are two of the people in the computing department we've been collaborating with with some of the, uh, the, the data analysis, as is Jeff and, and, and Marek. Um, and I hope I've given you at least some perspective in the way you can apply proteomics um, to analyze cell biological problems and to highlight some of the challenges and opportunities available. Thank you.